Is part two of what I'm calling British colonial transportation of natives. We're going to New Zealand. Our ancestor in the spirit to rise. We ask him to rise up. The time for lying in state is over. We ask him to rise so we can take him back home. Having grown up in New Zealand, we grew up very aware of the New Zealand wars having taken place and that in fact was the context for their transportation. These men had been involved as part of a much, much larger group, as was often the case, in warfare in the Hutt Valley over some contested land and they retreated up into the hills. But as winter set in and hunger um, forced people out of the hills, a group were in fact arrested and subject to court martial. And five of the men, so we have Hohebetio Mara, Te Komite, Te Rahui, Batu Tikiaki, and Te Waratiti, were in fact shipped over to Hobart. Having been taken in arms and in open rebellion against the Queen's sovereign authority and government of New Zealand, aiding and assisting the rebel chief Tarangi Hayata and being unlawfully in possession of a firelock, the property of Her Majesty the Queen, they are to be transported as felons for the term of their natural lives. There was actually a huge outcry. Colonists in Hobart poured down to the waterfront to see them arrive. Their clothing, they all came in traditional dress. Their clothing appeared exotic. They were seen as being, you know, very superior. And the New Zealanders, the white New Zealanders, were seen as being atrocious in their treatment of the Māori. And, and this is, you know, Vandemonian colonists condemning the New Zealanders for their treatment of Indigenous people. Their greatest offence seems to have been the defence of their country against what they conceived to be foreign aggression, and they are doubtfully implicated in a murder committed under the excitement of hostilities and in the reckless violence of warfare. Hobart Town Courier, 1846. George Grey, the Governor of New Zealand, actually wanted them sent to Port Arthur or Norfolk Island, and he wanted them to write home because they were in fact literate to write home about these horrendous experiences they would have there to dissuade other Māori from resisting the colonial authorities. But in fact they were sent instead to Maria Island after the colonists in Hobart put up uh, you know, an outcry about the idea that they would be sent to these other places. Under Dr Imri's attentive care, the prisoners were as comfortable as they could be rendered consistently with their situation. The loss of liberty and their expatriation are their principal sources of sorrow and regret. Colonial Times, Hobart, 1848. But their life was quite different from that of other indigenous convicts. If we think back to David Sturman labouring in a government gang and you know, other Australian Aboriginal convicts doing similar sorts of work, the Māori were instead, in fact, given their own separate accommodation, which they helped build. They had an overseer who could communicate in Māori. They did tasks such as veggie gardening. They were allowed to go hunting and fishing on certain days. They did Bible study. They had quite a close and warm relationship, it would seem, with their overseer's extended family who lived with him there on Mariah Island. They were only there for a couple of years, actually, really just the time it took for a ship to sail to England with a letter from the Tasmanian Lieutenant Governor asking, you know, for these men to be pardoned so he could return them to New Zealand and, again, you know, for the response to, to be brought back from England. Monday, April 19th, 1847. Wet day. Pohepa complaining of pain in the side. Ordered feet in warm water and a dose of salts. The men did exhibit signs of illness and Hohepa actually became gravely ill and suffered from tuberculosis. Wednesday, April 21st. Maoris employed cutting and carrying wood, except, however, ordered to keep in his bed. Like many people who are gravely ill, he appeared to rally. But then after that, he was said to have, you know, faded quite quickly and in fact then died on Mariah Island. The tears flow. They are for you, Coro, for the
justice that befell you from the hands of the people who suppressed you. Our dear one, our grand ancestor Te Umaroa, you are now returning home. Over the years, Mariah Island underwent various transformations and has been used for a whole range of purposes once it was no longer a convict probation station. And it is a place where school children are taken on group excursions or visits. And in 1985, two little girls, two sisters, Sarah and Tilly Heald, whose dad happened to be from New Zealand, were on a school trip there. And when they went home, they told their father, Chris, about having seen this headstone. I noticed the gravestone on a visit to Marara and it seemed rather odd that a New Zealander was buried in the, in the graveyard. So further research uncovered a rather sad story and following the recent return of the Crowther collection of Tasmanian Aboriginal remains we thought it would be an appropriate gesture of goodwill to return the remains of this man to his homeland in New Zealand. And that of course really triggered a process of more than two years of negotiations between Tasmania, Canberra and New Zealand to be able to have him repatriated, Hohepatil Marae repatriated to his homeland. Sunday, July the 31st, archaeologists prepare to exhume Hohepa's remains. We measure the diagonals. Yeah. An historical record suggests that Hohepa's grave had been disturbed late last century and that the headstone may have been moved. Archaeologists aren't certain if any remains they might find will be Hohepa's. The bones we find, if we do find any, may well be of a, a European. So we have to distinguish, if we can, between um, the bones of a European and uh, Polynesian. Tuesday, the archaeologists meticulously work their way deeper. Just after noon, a small part of a coffin is exposed. It has some integrity at the moment, um, but it's very damp and, and crumbly. There's some clay here. It looks like uh, it might be the top of the disturbance, if there have been disturbance, of the grave. It's quite high, just underneath the turf. Wednesday. There's little sadness today. The Maoris enjoy joining in the dig, widening the opening to reveal more of the coffin. Oh, we're just cleaning off the, the top of the coffin. Just discovered what may be um, deliberate markings on the, on the top of the coffin. Uh, there appears to be an H, maybe a hipper. Using a scalpel and small knife, the lid is gently prized off. The Maoris request we all leave the graveside to show respect for their koro. The time is close. Some remains are found. We are not permitted to film them. The archaeologists confirmed the Polynesian origin of the six foot one long skeletal remains of Hohepa Te Umaroa. I felt uh, as if something has lifted off me while I was standing there when Matthew was saying the prayers. And uh, the wind had given us a sign. It gave me the sign that they were around gave me that inspiration that the Koran is saying to me, saying to us, I am ready to go. Thursday, Lay weaves a ceremonial mat. She found the flax here and the casket will rest in it for its voyage home. It will be buried along with the remains. has a look at the backstory behind the arrests, trials and criminalisation of these men, one can see that more often than not there were 
very large groups and sometimes groups that had got together with other groups of Aboriginal people that were involved in a very concerted endeavour to drive colonists from their country. And at the time, of course, we can see how some of these men were criminalised. It was held by the courts that you couldn't have one group of British subjects at war with another group of British subjects, Aboriginal people being considered British subjects. And this has created a real problem at that time and down into the present day where there has in fact been perhaps a level of unwillingness to go back and have a close look at that record to see what really was going on. Hepa Te Umaroa was laid to rest in his country overlooking the Wanganui River in 1988. And in 2011, his story was told in song by the New Zealand Opera. The South African Heritage Council has been behind moves to have David Sturman's body sent home to the Cape. But as you heard Christian say, Kristen say in that program, it's very difficult to know where or even if he was buried in Sydney. This program was produced by Lorena Allam and Louise Mitchell. This is Hindsight on RN. My name is Dom Alessio. In 1842, just eight years after the Port Phillip colony was established in Victoria, two Aboriginal men became the first people to be hanged in Melbourne. Those men were from Tasmania. They were convicted of the murder of two whale hunters in the Western Port area after a wild spree on the run in country Victoria. Their names were Tanamirawait and Malboyhina, and they were brought across from Tasmania by the governor, George Augustus Robinson. How they came to be in Victoria is a long and heartbreaking story, and you'll be able to hear more of it on Hindsight in the coming weeks. Late last year, Melbourne City Council voted unanimous. OK, that seems to be the end of uh, <clears throat> the story for today. Warbles on a lot of YouTube. Ciao.